Hello and welcome to The Two View, the cutting edge educational show for PAs and nurse practitioners in emergency medicine and urgent care. My name is Michael Sharma. I am a practicing emergency medicine and urgent care PA in Dallas, Texas, and an adjunct professor of PA studies. Hey Mike, I'm Martha Roberts, and I'm an emergency medicine NP and assistant professor in Northern California. Happy New Year. It's, is it 2022 already? I can't believe it. Okay, this is great. Well, 2022, you know, you're back. You're stuck in the past. It is 2023. I am always stuck in the past, I feel like. Well, Happy New Year to, to you and everyone listening as well. It's nice when we just both have nothing going on in our lives. We can sit down and have a leisurely chat, right? Right, right. Well, the new semester has definitely started, and um, it's a bit of a... A whirlwind. It's not a mess. It's just busy. You know, it's always very organized chaos. There you go. Yeah. Just like the emergency department. Well, exactly. T- today I started onboarding at my brand new emergency medicine job. Tomorrow I research on ACLS and PALS and may still have a little work to do. Greg, please don't judge me on this if you're listening. You know I always do a good job here. <laughs> Just push hard and fast in the center of the chest, Mike. That's all you have to say. Patients, right. patients got a fever. Push hard and fast in the center of the chest. Your patient's getting up off the bed and trying to thank you. Slap their hand away and push hard and fast on the center of their chest. Right. Well, speaking of that, we are going to push into our new hard and fast format we introduced before our December Live at Boot Camp episode. First, in keeping with the radiology-themed puns on our show, it's the wet read where Martha and I get 60 quick seconds to talk about something that caught our eye. Next, it's a dry scan where we penetrate a little deeper into two other topics. Today, we'll talk about a finger and a pediatric cough gone bad. Oh, God. Not in the same patient, though. Thankfully not, yes. Lastly, it's our oral contrast segment where we get into all the nooks and crannies of a topic. For something that we do a lot of, we still learned a lot about wound repair, and I'm eager for us to talk about the evidence or not behind some of the things we do and talk about with the patients and how it can make our lives maybe easier on our next shift. Easier is always better and more favorable. As always, everything that we cite, every article, every website, everything you can find at our website at the number two view.fireside.fm. That's the number two view.fireside.fm. Well, here we go. The wet read. Dear doctor letter. Dear doctor, imagine getting a letter in the mail telling you that you had a patient you saw and prescribed opioids to and now was dead from an opioid related overdose. Pretty chilling stuff. A randomized perspective controlled study published in January 2023 in the JAMA Network Open suggested that clinicians who got such a letter about one of their patients were likely to change their practice and prescribed around 8% less opioids for at least a year woo, after receiving this letter. This was measured in MMEs or morphine milligram equivalents. This study included physicians as well as PAs. Mm, okay, gotcha. Well, I'm not sure what to say about this. You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how this can uh, make something different about our practice. Maybe this just speaks to how important it is to measure things in our departments that we're trying to change. When it's measured and it's commented upon, I think we as humans are, are apt to act on these things. Well, Mike, I know that this is a severe issue. There are many problems, many variables, and opioids are killing many people. However, the pendulum has gone too far. And we've talked about this in our pain segments before with Sergey Motov, Rick Bucata, uh, and the late, great Jim Roberts. The problem is, is that pain medicines are still needed for some things, right? So I know a nurse practitioner recently who prescribed 10, 10 Percocet to a patient mm. as an outpatient, okay? Not from the ER doors, had a appropriate license, DEA, everything was legal and legit about it. But not only did he get a letter that said, We see you wrote a script for narcotics without e-prescribing, but also the patient. The patient got a letter that said, you recently got a prescription for opioids, and it was four pages of information about addiction, the laws, regulations, and everything else about the opioid. Everyone was given a letter. Wow. Do you know, was it from like the pharmacy board or like the nursing board? Like, I know you probably don't want to betray any confidence here, but like, can you shed further light on where this came from? Do you know? Well, I'm going to pull out a copy of the letter that a friend uh, sent to me to review. 
And the first letter to the patient basically talks about um, OptumRx. OptumRx is the pharmacy benefit manager for CalPERS, and they're committed to helping make informed decisions about getting the most value out of your prescription benefit. This letter is provided for educational purposes only. The letter goes on that says, you were prescribed 10 tablets of oxycodone on December, blah, 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 blah. These narcotic medications are generally, and you get the idea of what it says. It's important so safety. Optum, Optum mm-hmm. is who sent this to the patient. This is to the patient from Optum, yes. Okay. Now, the letter to the provider came in an email format, and I don't have access to that, but essentially it said, why are you prescribing without e-prescriptions? What's going on? But, but do you know, was it nursing board? Was it pharmacy? Like, where it was do you think DEA. It the, the big D, the federal DEA. Correct. Boish. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's um that's some uh, big brother big sister stuff here. Uh, uh But Mike, this is the problem. I There's nothing wrong with appropriately prescribing things to patients outside of the hospital walls as long as it's allowed. Yeah. It's not illegal and the hospital doesn't pay for your DEA. Now, if the hospital's paying for your DEA, you usually typically sure. cannot prescribe outside the doors. But for those of you that are paying for your own DEA and practicing on the side somewhere else, there's no reason why you can't write a script for a patient. However, the DEA is saying you can't. You have to e-prescribe everything and if you need an exception, you need to apply for an exception. Wow. So just to let you know, I'm a big fan of of watching and being careful with this drug, but I don't know how I feel about being this heavily controlled and monitored. I'm not sure how I feel about it. Is it a good yeah. deal? Is it a bad deal? I don't know. Is there something else they could be doing with their time, frankly, than than chasing after ten Percocets going out to somebody? With I'm guessing with a clinician who does not have a habit of doing this sort of thing. Anyway, that's that's kind of bizarre and, and kind of worrisome, frankly. Yeah. Well, uh, my uh, wet read is about Demar Hamlin. By now, we've almost all heard about NFL football player Demar Hamlin's on-field cardiac arrest, including uh, endless speculation about the possible cause to include something called commotio cordis. Commotio cordis occurs when blunt force strikes the heart, the, I guess the chest wall, really, at precisely the wrong time in the cardiac cycle, namely the first half of the T wave, while the ventricles are still repobolizing. This blunt force triggers pressure-sensitive ion channels, which leads to a lethal arrhythmia. There's no actual trauma, um, bruising, disruption anatomically uh, going on here. Rapidly initiating chest compressions and defibrillation are what can save the day, and thankfully, that's what he got. I think it's important, though, even now that Hamlin has been discharged neurologically intact from the hospital, to refrain from speaking definitively about what happened here or about any other stuff that we see happening um, in mass media. Someone has a big injury or goes to the hospital. We may be the one medical person that people know. Let's be careful about how, um, you know... We speak about these things. I gave a talk on Facebook a couple of weeks ago where I talked more about Hamlin, Commotio Cordis, and a Cornell University lacrosse player who died of Commotio Cordis in 2004. Or did he? Check the links in the show notes for that talk as well as a recent article about Hamlin's apparently very good in hospital care. Yeah, I think there's two things here. I think it's also a friendly reminder that out-of-hospital CPR can uh, be a life-saving thing. Um, if you want to get busy, recertifying now is a good time to do it. Anytime is a good time to do it. Even if your facility doesn't require it, which I'd be surprised if they didn't, you're retired or you're not working clinically, go get it. You never know when you might be called to assist or instruct someone else how to do CPR. In addition, I think it sounds like I've been complaining a lot already and we're only into minute <laughs> 10. But I agree with you. I think it's not that the public is expecting every detail about Damar and demanded the diagnosis to be shared. Now, in this case, his information may help others and he's willing to share it. That's fine. But it's really no one's business, if you ask me, um, which you didn't, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And the speculation about the other diagnoses were completely inappropriate. I think the best bet is to learn from what they are willing to share, the, the patient, and then leave the per person alone. Forget about it. Cheers. Okay, so moving on to segment two, our dry scan. So let's talk a little bit about digital ischemia. We ended last year on a podcast talking about paronychia management. 
You can listen to that on episode 22, but let's start the year with another finger case. And this is from The Clinical Advisor, a great website to keep your eyes on. They describe a middle-aged male with end-stage renal disease on dialysis who has been having a painful, discolored, atraumatic finger for four days. You know, a patient like this is likely coming to an NP or PA and may not even get a bed for hours, right? So you might even be tempted to discharge the patient from triage if you happen to be there with a triage nurse. No trauma, no excruciating pain. I mean, how bad can this be, right? Let's talk about a very elegant way that an NP or PA at the top of their game, the astute clinician, as I like to say, might make the right diagnosis for this patient, even from triage. And that would lead to this patient rightfully being admitted admitted for further workup. As always, it starts with, as I always say, a very good history and physical exam. The history is non-contributory and the vital signs look normal in this particular patient. On physical exam, the patient's single affected finger is tender, darker looking than the rest. And when you touch it, it's cooler than the rest when you touch those comparatively. At this point, one emergent diagnosis should leap to the top of your differential, acute digital ischemia. Dun, dun, dun. The elegant way that you can essentially lock in this diagnosis, even from triage, you ask? A pulse oximeter applied to the finger with digital ischemia will likely have a decreased SpO2. In this case, it was 74% compared to a 98% on the contralateral finger. Go figure. Okay. So beyond what you found, how else do you get an atraumatic finger pain patient admitted to the hospital? Yeah. And from triage. Um, Start with some basic labs. Okay. In this case, I'd include coag since we're concerned about circulation issues. Even though there's no apparent history of trauma, an x-ray would be a good idea just in case something completely unexpected is found and the patient seems... um, to need admission, of course the hospital is going to act for, ask for that as well. Um, but if you have questions about other additional tests, talk to the hospitalist about it. Lastly, an EKG, and in this patient, a cardiac monitor. In this case, the EKG was normal, but prolonged monitoring revealed intermittent episodes of atrial fibrillation. Not a huge surprise here, though. Patients with chronic kidney disease are at an increased risk for atrial fibrillation. So props to Dr. Brady Pregerson, and the clinical advisor for this great case and reminder not to sleep on even something that looks as simple as a finger boo-boo. Right, yeah. Uh, let's see, what else can we do here? Um, you know, we're all about imaging in emergency medicine land here, so uh, maybe some sort of a an MR angiogram I think is indicated. In fact, uh, you showed me an article very recently, Martha, about some um, ischemic in, uh, emergencies of the uh, extremities here. So we'll have that and recommendations imaging in the show notes. Also, inflammatory markers, like usually rheumatologic stuff, like Renaud's or whatever, is multiple fingers, but like, hey, they're being admitted like, go ahead and order, you know, your ANA and your ESR and your CRP for this patient just to kind of, you know, speed things along for them. Yeah, you know, Mike, I think this is a good reminder that because of our pressing times in large uh, volume waiting rooms, I think it's very easy for our, our peers and for ourselves to sometimes say, this is not an emergency and you need to go home. I mean, I could tell you case after case recently that I saw that some other clinician or nurse or somebody I was working with seemed really burnt out. And they're like, oh, it's just a corneal abrasion. But then when I looked closer, it was shingles of the eye. Okay. Or another patient that, uh, you know, had maybe blurry vision um, and Nah, the eye looks kind of cloudy. It, it wasn't a big deal. Ended up being a cute <laughs> narrow angle closure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things. Oh, a big laceration to the thumb. Oh, it's just a laceration. Just show it. Just sew it up real quickly. Get the patient out of here. Go in there. Complete severance of the uh, halicus, halicus pollicis longus. Mm. Um, so don't don't go to that point in in your practice where you're just like, oh, you know, I got to move the meat. There's still a lot of really bad stuff out there. 
Yeah, I uh, I am frankly terrified, you know, of this is, you know, having I am under time pressure and uh, I don't want to miss those things, whether it's because of time pressure. Like, you know, like sometimes I'll, I'll do an exam in uh, the triage, like the patient's in a chair or in a wheelchair. It's like how good of a abdominal exam or a complete spine exam am I going to get with somebody like writhing in a wheelchair, you know? So it's just a it's a hard it's a hard life we live, um, but it's a good life. Yeah. And, you know, my. Mike, how about this one first? Sobering thought. A uh, 22-year-old male who was vomiting nonstop had a big night of partying. Well, he had an esophageal tear and a pneumomediastinum. And after the fifth time that he finally complained to the nurses who rolled their eyes, oh, you're 22 and young and over and uh, hung over, we finally did a chest x-ray and whoops. Yeah, we had a Borhobs patient the other day too. How bizarre is that? Man, okay. Mm-hmm. People need to like take it easy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I subscribe to a lot of medical emails. One I recommend is called the Med Mal Reviewer by a physician who reviews malpractice cases. He is on Substack at expertwitness.substack.com. A recent email from him really spooked me. It's about another one of these cases. You know, a seven-year-old comes to the ED in the middle of the night after being sick for one whole day with the chief complaint of a croupy cough and fever. He was seen by both the emergency medicine PA and physician, tested negative for RSV, but positive for flu B, <laughs> noted to have no distress breathing by both clinicians, and sent home after some dexamethasone for that croupy cough. How many of those patients have we seen like this week? The, okay. you know, yesterday, last year if we were on here. Mm-hmm. 36 hours later, the child went to cardiac arrest and died at home with an autopsy showing necrotizing pneumonia and blood cultures positive for group A strep. Let's talk about invasive group A strep or eye gas infections. We see group A strep pharyngitis and skin infections all the time. But when group A strep becomes invasive, it can lead to things like sepsis, toxic shock syndrome, and necrotizing fasciitis. That's what we're talking about with eye gas infections. We have a CDC Health Alert Network health advisory here published on December 22, 2022, that says towards the end of last year, the CDC was notified of a possible increase in pediatric eye gas infections over previous years. What's going on here? One possibility is our severe influenza season. The 2022-23 flu season looks to be one of the worst in 10 years, and higher rates of eye gas infection have been previously seen during times of increased flu activity. That could be because people recently or concurrently infected with viral infections like the flu are at increased risk for eye gas infections. Here's one more reason to get your flu shot. Influenza vaccination seems to decrease mortality from eye gas infections. Hmm. Thankfully for now, our country's flu numbers are on the decline. This can be monitored a week to week at the CDC's FluView website. Uh, not the two view, FluView. So you can Google for that. It's a cool website. I always talk about it at boot camp. Some other thoughts. Patients can have multiple infections at one time. If you have a patient with an influenza-like illness, don't anchor on influenza as the sole diagnosis, especially for patients who seem to be worsening or otherwise bouncing back, especially in patients unvaccinated against influenza. We have links to the iGAS case from the MedMal reviewer including some bizarre expert witness testimony, a microbiology journal article getting deeper into the link between influenza and eye gas and a link to the CDC site and our website here at twoview.fireside.fm. Well, time now for our oral contrast segment. And yeah, we're going to talk about laceration repair, okay? Because look, you know, some of these things, it's like, yeah, yeah, we know how to repair lacerations. But in my opinion, the more common something is that we do or prescribe or whatever, we should know every dang thing about it. So like I said, I was kind of surprised by some of the things that that we went over in this uh, article. So um Specifically, we're going to talk about picking the right method of wound repair and what kind of evidence is in the literature behind these choices that we we make often on a daily basis. Yeah, so Dr. Justin Morgenstern from uh, first10em.com released a really impressive set of articles on his website at the end of last year regarding wound repair. All of the things on wound repair, how late is too late, when to use absorbable sutures, aftercare topics like 
prophylactic antibiotics, topical antibiotics, so many topics and variables that we discuss with patients all the time. And the link to the article we'll be discussing today, of course, will be on our website, uh, the two of you, the fireside.fm. All right, well, Dr. Morgeson makes some really good overarching points before he gets into the studies. A lot of things potentially benefit outcomes in wound repair. Uh, you got irrigation, aftercare, infection management, the list goes on. And a lot of these studies do not standardize these things in the studies. This is something to consider when you're reading, frankly, any study that claims to show a benefit of X over Y. Are there potential confounding factors? And are those confounding factors standardized across? across the board. Another thing is that the end point of many of these wound repair studies is cosmesis. And as they say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Studies with subjective endpoints have a risk of bias. As a friend of the podcast, Dr. Ken Milne is fond of pointing out, it's important that we look beyond what is being recommended and also look at the strength of evidence behind the recommendation. P.S. Uh, Ken Milne has a new TikTok website, so check it out. Look for the S Gem on TikTok. I think it's another platform for him to be silly and awesome, um, but also so smart. All right, so let's talk about skin adhesive. Dermabond is one of the most common trade names of this method of wound repair, but there are many. I think most people use skin adhesive for small, clean lacerations that aren't over joint spaces or hairy areas, although I've used them on hairy areas before. Are those the right considerations to be used for skin adhesive? Well, so for example, let's talk lacerations over joints. A 1999 randomized control trial included about 60 kids who had extremity lacerations over joints. The trial compared, help me out here, Mike. Uh, you know, it's your standard octocrinoacrylate. Yeah. Oh, you know, just or, whatever. Uh, sci- sorry, I, screwed, I mean, I screwed up. Cyanoacrylate. Yeah, that's I think how you say that. So that's basically a Dermabond-like substance to the 5.0 non-absorbable sutures. And the study found no difference in the cosmetic outcome and no significant difference in complication like uh, dehiscence or infection. And here's the fine print. The skin adhesive was reinforced by sterile tape and the affected joint was splinted and immobilized for seven to 10 days. All right, so this is really a trial comparing sutures to the combination of skin adhesive, sterile yeah. tape, and splinting. Got it. Well, <laughs> this is where like the cheap dad in me comes out, like a knee jerk reaction. It feels like a huge cost to get away from just yeah. throwing a few sutures in someone. Uh, although honestly, even when I am suturing over a joint, I'm talking with the patient or the parent about like some sort of immobilization, even something as simple an elastic bandage to remind the patient like, hey, you've got a thing here. Uh, I don't know what sutures I could put into someone that could resist somebody doing a deep squat or flexing their elbow real hard. The author puts his personal opinion in the article that he uses skin adhesives over joints even without splinting, which I think is really interesting. Well, how about length of laceration? I think some of us get a little leery of closing longer wounds with skin adhesive. There are a couple of RCTs covered in this article that talk about closing uncomplicated wounds that are four, five, even eight centimeters in length, so several inch long wounds. One of the RCTs did utilize a layer of deep sutures for lax 0.5 centimeters deep or greater, but in the end, there was no significant difference in cosmesis for these wounds that some may consider longer, maybe even too long for a skin adhesive. If you're still worried, something to consider is supplementing the skin adhesive with an occasional strip of sterile tape, like what was done in the earlier study over joints. Now, I know our listeners who don't have YouTube or are watching the podcast can't see that, but that's, look at that, that's eight centimeters right there. That's like, how's your finger compared to that? Where's your, let's see a little comparison. So like about your finger, not counting the the nail. Yeah, that's, I mean, I got long, long nails That's a long laceration. Right yeah. That's crazy. What? Interesting. Always very interesting to read stuff like that. So let's talk about scalp lacerations. I think a lot of us instinctively reach for a stapler. I got one of those. You know, when I was younger, my dad stapled lots of things on our body with this very stapler right here in my hand. Oh I'm Hopefully not even clean kidding. it off afterwards. I don't know if he did. Um, <laughs> in fact, so the Cochrane reviews of skin adhesive, which are admittedly kindly out of date, um, 
specifically included hair bearing areas. Let's take you all the way back to 1988. Oh, Lordy. Okay, Mike, weren't you, where were you born? Were you born in 1988? I was alive. I was in grade school. I already rocked a pretty sweet set of Coke bottle glasses and a bowl (laughs) cut as well. So I was looking pretty stylish in 88. I think I was six years old and from what I can recall, it was a good time. Anyway, I was cranking up my boom box for Whitney Houston and George Michael at that time. That's what, that's what I should say. Even back in 1988, it was known that skin adhesive was likely an acceptable option for scalp lacerations. An observational study covered pediatric and adult patients with scalp lacerations that were less than six hours old, clean, less than six centimeters in length, and not deep enough to go through the galia. All lacs were closed with skin adhesive. Of the 50 patients in this study, 49 of the 50 wounds were fully healed at five days without infection. One one centimeter wound had three millimeters of dishiscence and uh, some serous drainage that did not require any further intervention. Mike, I feel like most of the scalp wounds I deal with in ED would have met criteria for inclusion in this study. Yeah, I, I've stapled a lot of like small pediatric scalp wounds in my day, and I've I frankly felt like a little dumb about it. Like the kids either hate the stapling or they hate the anesthesia beforehand. No parent likes to see their kid freaking out. I'm gonna strongly consider skin adhesive for future small lacerations of the scalp. Also consider the hair apposition technique where the patient's own hair is used to help close the wound. You pull strands of hair from each side of the wound across the wound and you twist them around each other and then you apply skin adhesive at the base of the twisted hair. Personally, I've never fiddled around with this technique, more for fear of looking awkward than anything else, but it is also something to consider with scalp wax. In the end, like we said initially, there is some messiness to the quality of the data, but I am somewhat reassured that many studies covering common wounds we see in the ED all either seem to be pretty similar in terms of results of skin adhesive versus suturing, or maybe even like favoring the skin adhesive in certain aspects like patient preference, patient comfort. None of them are super down to the mouth when it comes to skin adhesive. Martha, what's your takeaway in terms of skin adhesive? Does this any of this change your practice at all? Glue a bunch more things than you weren't gluing before. There you go. Good summary. I like that. Well, all right. How about sterile tape? Steri strips are a common trade name for this device, but again, there are many brands out there most likely. One major advantage in many practice settings where I work is that nurses and medics are often trained on how to use sterile tape. As fast as I am with skin adhesive, what's even faster is me asking someone else to close the wound and I can work on the discharge paperwork. I often tell patients when I'm about to use a skin adhesive that there's less scarring with skin adhesive than there's a suturing, like no one likes a scar, so they kind of go along with me using the skin adhesive. But how about with sterile tape? Multiple RCTs discussed in the article suggest that when comparing sterile tape, to skin adhesive for clean and simple lacerations in low tension areas, not involving mucous membranes. So there are some, you know, uh, qualifications here. In those situations, cosmesis was either the same with sterile tape as it was for skin adhesives or better than skin adhesive with the sterile tape. So I'm going to stop you right there. And I'm going to ask about sterile tape compared to our heavyweight championship, um, you know, fixer of the world would be the suture, right? right? So one small multi-center randomized control trial compared wounds not penetrating up to five centimeters in length without needing debridement and were either closed with suture technique or reinforced reinforced sterile tape method with a second layer of sterile tape running parallel to the wound and reinforcing the first layer. At two months, the scar width was no different. In fact, it was better <laughs> in wounds less than two centimeters in length. Oh, let me stop right there. So I, I screwed up the script here. Not penetrating the muscle was that phrase. That's not that's not your bad, that's my bad. So a relatively shallow wound not penetrating the muscle. That was the qualification for this RCT. Okay, makes sense. The two other trials comparing post-procedure wounds in ankle arthroscopy and dermatology clinic skin excision revealed very similar cosmetic appearances in the long term. In fact, in the short term, the derm clinic wounds closed by tape looked better. I'm curious to see how my colleagues in the ED 
are going to respond if I start asking to do sterile tape on things that um, they don't usually tape. I have a feeling I'm going to have to kind of like show a couple, like you know, like I'll, I'll have they'll have to see one from me before they do one. Um, but uh, this is another thing I might be looking to expand my practice on here. Uh, what do you think, Martha? I think we start. We need to start giving some of these more simpler things the respect they deserve. And that means they should give you the respect you deserve, Sharma. <laughs> give sterile tape. Sterile tape should respect me. Is that what you're saying here? That is right. <laughs> Very good. Okay. <laughs> I'll make sure I, I demand it of them next time. Well, let's wrap it up by talking about staples. A couple of small RCTs were noted in the article. You know what they found? Staples are faster than sutures. Huh. Who would have no thought way. that? Yeah, seriously. Well, I want to know how many thousands of dollars of grant money went towards funding those studies because the authors probably should pay it back. Right. Anyway, they noted that in scalp lacerations, there was no difference in cosmetic outcomes after a few months. Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Morgenstern also notes that for as many times as he sees orthopedic surgical wounds closed up with staples, there doesn't seem to be very much high-quality evidence be, uh, for the use of staples in this setting. In fact, a 2020, sorry, 2010 systematic review and meta-analysis, or SERMA, that included six studies, only half of them being randomized, suggested that there was a relative risk ratio of 3.8, meaning that there was almost four times as many um, skin infections when you're closing the ortho wound with staples instead of sutures. With a confidence interval uh, somewhat broad, uh, 1.4 to 10.7, but still favoring the sutures instead of staples. A more recent SERMA in 2020 found 42 RCTs involving a total of over 11,000 patients, but the SERMA authors, the, the meta-analysis authors, felt that the poor quality of all the RCTs, frankly, and poor specifics of the info made it difficult to pull out any clinically relevant points. Shots fired at our ortho colleagues there. Well, I, I think it, Mike, I think that... <laughs> The stapler is very archaic, and I have, this is triggering me right now, the stapler <laughs> on my desk. Um, I, I hear the tremor in your voice as you as you hold this item here, yeah. So I really think that maybe we should look at some of these archaic processes we've been doing and think to ourselves, I think we have better options. You know, I am... Um, it's like your second husband, right? Like you didn't <laughs> know they existed. I, I, have, I have no frame of reference here, actually. <laughs> um, you know, I, I recall one time there was a, an inmate who had a big laceration and was, you know, a, a wound repair away from going off to to being confined, basically. And I, uh, he had been pretty violent earlier in the day to other people. And I went in there and I stapled his arm. Like, I don't usually staple extremities. I usually staple scalps and, like, scalps that's about it like, i don't really do any other visible ones here and i kind of just what about scalps do you do scalps I, I, I'll, too? I will staple scalps if asked kindly yes um but yeah i i was justifying it to myself kind of like well uh, i and i was taught this i was taught that surgical staples less chance of infection than sutured wounds but like apparently not at least not in the orthopedic surgical setting so yeah. Tricky situation, it is faster, and, and that was another consideration of mine, frankly. I didn't want to be sitting there for a half an hour, and um, he, you know, he, this person got kind of a, a funny idea involving me. I kind of wanted to be in and out of that room. What yeah. do you think about staples? You want to just kind of get rid of them, frankly. Like, yeah, I, guess, I really don't feel the need for them anymore. Can you think, and I'm going to put you on the spot now, can you think of a wound where you were like, staples are the best? best way to close this in terms of wounds we see in the ed nope nope not at all i know right yeah well how about a super long a super long scalp laceration i'm just being devil's advocate here super no. long a scalp laceration no so how would you do it well i would sew it and i would probably suspect that there are other layers especially the gallia underneath that are um involved because a, a laceration like that you don't just get a a a shallow long lack unless someone like took a little tack and just like scraped it along the top of your scalp <laughs> right so maybe you're not exploring enough and um evaluating and um maybe you're getting lazy and thinking hey you know what Pfft, i don't care about that hematoma that's going to form later 
Well, it's funny you mentioned that, right? So, like, something that I used to talk about with with our friend P.A. Chip Lang when we would do our trauma talks here, you know, we both agree that, like, people can bleed out from scalp wounds. Yeah. So, like, go ahead and staple the scalp wound shut early on, okay? Um, but from my recent reading, I was also told, like, just like you, like, literally just like you said, staples don't penetrate deep enough like if you really have a person with a badly bleeding scalp like i had the other day they're on anticoagulants you should actually get in there with some you know a big needle and throw some deep sutures and really bring several layers of skin together and that way you will get some hemostasis much better than than um staples i i I suture this lady's head and and i saw it kind of like raised a bit and i was like What's going on here? And I just, I, because I'm an idiot, I pushed on the raised part and it just oh kind of like, like it just like squirted on my scrub. It's like just a, a river of blood. And I was like, oh, okay, got it. There's a hematoma under there now. Got it. So awesome. yeah, uh, deeper sutures. Not Lessons staples. learned. Lessons learned. Well, <laughs> Mike, you know, I got to say, it was tough getting me to my desk tonight and uh, taught for nine hours and I really didn't want to hear myself talk at all. But you did most of the talking so I feel good about that. Did I? And I, I got to, to wave a ruler at you so even better. Um, <laughs> let's go on and end the show today with our two view trivia answer. If you've got some great cases, go ahead and email us. Um, we'll give you the email address. It's, what is our email address this day, these days? Uh, the, it, it is always twoviewcast at gmail.com um, that is the number two viewcast at gmail.com. Ah, uh, yes. And we announced our trivia contest winner in uh, Las Vegas live during our last episode, which was really fun, by the way. Yes, it was. Um, check out episode 22 for uh, the complete everything, end all be all that was in Vegas. And here is this month's two part trivia question. One of our first segments was about Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin. What was the first jersey number that the Bills retired, and who wore it before it was retired? Email us your two-part answer, in addition to anyone you'd like us to give a shout-out to, as well as any feedback or comments about any episode, maybe our new format, our hard and fast format here, again, to twoviewcast at gmail.com. That's the number, twoviewcast at gmail.com. Well, more information on the original Advanced Emergency Medicine Boot Camps, the Emergency Medicine and Acute Care course, or any of our courses are available at the Center for Medical Education's website. That is www.ccme.org, www.ccme.org. Martha, um, not yet, no dates yet correct uh new and upcoming courses to be announced soon for 2023 keep checking back on the website for more for the advanced boot camp and our original boot camps but the critical care um acute care series courses are all listed with some really cool locations that's right yes so if you've had enough of vegas for the year you can go to other places like i'm pretty sure key west i'm pretty sure new orleans i'm pretty sure is it where in California is it this year? Is it San Diego, San, San Fran? Fr- uh, San Francisco and San Diego, I believe. Both? Um, okay, very good. All right, there you go. So, hey, well, great. So, check out those other locations. But if you want to come viva it up with us in Las Vegas, we'd love to see you there. Thank you for listening and attending this episode of The Two View. You can subscribe and rate us on Apple iTunes Podcasts. Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Search for Two View Emergency. That's the number two, View Emergency, and it'll come right up. Ratings help us climb the charts so that other clinicians get some Two View goodness. And hey, go ahead and write some extra stuff in the ratings there. Maybe we'll read it on the air. We'll read your rating on the air. If you like YouTube and want to see the video blog, if you want to see Martha's Ruler, if you want to see her stapler of trauma, search for a Center for Medical Education and you can catch the video version. Don't forget our website where you can go next level on any of our topics from any of our episodes, including all the papers and sites we referred to. That's twoview.fireside.fm. Our audio and video engineers are Ricky Bucata and Dave Pett. Show notes are by Meg Dipple. Meg, the notes are done finally for one. So, you know, we, we did that for you. Here are the quick announcements. We've got Maui in March. We've got New Orleans in April. We've got Ooh. San Diego, not San Francisco, in June. Um, we also have Vail in March and Las Vegas in April. These are all the acute care series courses. There's Hilton Head in May, 
Nashville, also in May. Also in June is New York, New York. August is Vancouver. And then finally, my heart and soul are in Key West in November to the first week in December. But that's it for today. And we really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you for tuning in, friends in EM. Share this podcast with a friend. Share your thoughts via email. And thanks for sharing your time with us on the two of you. Have a good day and a great shift.